from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back here at the Book Festival, one of the great, I think the greatest book festival in, in the country. Um, I, I want to say a few, a few words about my uh, recent book, Empire of Liberty, uh, which is, uh, uh, the subtitle is A History of the Early Republic, 1789-1815. It's part of the larger Oxford project of the history of the United States, which is nearing completion, uh, about a dozen volumes, and I think there are about four, maybe four or five left to do, but they've been commissioned, and I, that it should finally bring to an end uh, a, a project that, that began in the 1950s, more than, more than a half century ago. My, my assignment was 1789 to 1815, which is one of the most extraordinary, if not the most extraordinary period in American history. I think we should start by recognizing how important the American Revolution is to us. Uh, it is, in my mind, the most significant event in American history, bar none. It not only legally created the United States, but it brought, it, it, it infused our culture with almost everything we believe. Our, our highest aspirations, our no noblest ideals, all of these came out of the revolution. Our belief in equality, in liberty, in, in, in the well-being of ordinary people, in constitutionalism. So it's understandable why we go back to this period. I, I have people ask me uh, at, at events like this, what would George Washington think of, the in, of our invasion of Iraq? What would Thomas Jefferson think of, of affirmative action? Now, I don't know of any other culture where people would be asking that about past historical figures. I, I'm sure David Cameron in, in Great Britain is not asked, you know, what would William Pitt think about what you're doing? I mean, it's just not, it's just not possible. So it's something peculiar to us, and, and I think it has to do with the fact that that event, uh, the revolution and those people who led it, uh, are, who created our political institutions, by which we still live, uh, and also the, the, the values, the ideals by which we still live. We go back to them to refresh uh, our, ourselves, to reaffirm what we are as a people. Now, this period that I'm, that I'm dealing with in Empire of Liberty, that term, by the way, comes from Jefferson. That's the term he gave to what he thought was the United States project. Uh, the irony, of course, in that is that uh, a fifth of the population were, were, was enslaved. But uh, the, the notion that, that the United States was a special place begins in this period. Uh, they're struggling to identify themselves. After all, they were, by, by and large, the majority of the population, the overwhelming majority, was British. So how do you become Americans uh, when you're British? This is why the issue of impressment, the, seiz the British seizing of American sailors, and the ambiguity of citizenship was so important in this period. James Madison, as president, said the reason, the principal reason we have to go to war in the War of 1812 is because of this impressment. It goes to the heart of American identity. We didn't even know what to call ourselves. The term Columbia was tried in 1792 at the tercentenary of, the, of Columbus's discovery. They thought, well, maybe Columbia would be a good name, but that didn't stick, although it sounded good because you, the, the, uh, the, the syllables would, could be fitted into a lot of British songs, you know, Britannia, Columbia, and, and so it was very attractive. Samuel Mitchell, who was a senator from New York, suggested Freedonia. We are the Freedonians. Well, that didn't last either, and we were stuck with Americans, with the usurping a title that really belongs to people of both hemispheres. Why are we the Americans? The Canadians have never forgiven us for taking that, that title. So that was an issue running through the whole period. What, what kind of people are we? The government was contested between uh, the Hamiltonians who wanted a European type state, a fiscal military state that could take on the European states eventually on their own terms with a standing army, a big navy, uh, and a bureaucracy that was equal to any of, uh, of, of the Europeans versus the Jeff Jeffersonians, the Republicans, the D Democratic Republicans, followers of Jefferson who wanted a minimal state and wanted to use economic sanctions 
as an uh, alternative to the use of military force. This was the, the, the grand embargo that we w were involved in that Jefferson pr promoted in 1807. This was what we're still struggling with. How do you use economic sanctions as an alternative to military force? Because the use of military force is so, uh, so, so violent, so bloody, anything must be tried. That was Jefferson's rationale. It's a period of enormous uh, controversy. We came as close to a civil war in 1798 as we ever have, except for the actual civil war in the middle of the 19th century. So that, uh, and, and people were frightened that the French were going to invade and that a Francophile uh, president or uh, potential president, Jefferson, would, was leading a kind of fifth column of, of Francophiles, French supporters, who would create a, another French puppet in the United States. That was the Federalist fear. So it was a tremendously uh, uh, tumultuous period. The population was still growing, doubling every 20 years, the fastest growing population in the entire Western world. So it, it uh, and the pop this population's on the move. It's a period of extraordinary democratization. So much popularization, democratization, that it left those founders who lived into the 19th century deeply disillusioned with what they had wrought. It was, a, as you know, a creative period. Our institutions that we still live by, the Congress, the presidency, the Supreme Court, were all created in this period. Uh, it was a period of great instability, violence, uh, city mobs, uh, all kinds of homicide. Homicide rates skyrocketed in, in, uh, in New York City in the 1790s. Uh, it was a period of heavy drinking. Alcohol became, we became the highest uh, drinkers in the world, five gallons per person, uh, which we've never attained since and was the highest in the world, with the possible exception of Scotland. Uh, <laughs> these are all signs of, of, of instability in the society. People were, were simply in flux, uh, moving at enormous rates, uh, migrating to the west, more territory settled in the single generation following the revolution than in the entire 150 years of the colonial period. So people were already reaching the Mississippi in a relatively short period of time. Uh, it was uh, a, a period where college rioting, which we're, we think the 1960s were bad, there's nothing co comparable to what happened between 1798 and 1808. Colleges up and down the East Coast rioted, Students were expelled. Half the student body of colleges like uh, Williams or, or uh, Harvard were, uh, were expelled. Uh, the colleges weren't large. It would be 120 students, but 60 would be expelled. Enormous instability. Uh, Princeton, uh, the, the Nassau Hall was burned to the ground uh, by, uh, by student, presumably. No one knows for sure. This was a, a period of great instability in all areas. Religion transformed. The old European religions, the Anglican Church, the Congregationalists, were surpassed by these new evangelical religions of, of, of uh, Methodists and uh, uh, Baptists, growing by leaps and bounds, so that by 1810, the Methodists, who there were no Methodists in America in 1760, by 1810, it was the largest religious group in all of America and growing even more rapidly. Uh, Everywhere there was a popularization from art, literature. Uh, John Marshall wrote a five-volume biography of, of George Washington, which he expected to make some money from and that people would read. Nobody bought it. They bought uh, Parson Weems's short little biography, which emphasized Washington's youth. Marshall summed up Washington's youth in one page, in five volumes. He devoted one page, and nobody wanted to read those five volumes. Instead, they read read Parson Weems, which is still the fastest selling, most, uh, most uh, popular biography of Washington ever made. He, Weems is the one who made up the cherry tree myth. That's what people wanted to read about. They wanted to read about this young Washington. Now, they, the, the generation was filled with, with illusions, um, so many illusions. They thought political parties were awful, that they should disappear, there should be no political parties, faction was bad. Nonetheless, political parties emerged. They wanted to do well by the Indians in the Northwest. 
Henry Knox's letters to Washington about how we should treat the Indians, uh, even a modern anthropologist would endorse. But nonetheless, the popular movement was so great, it just overwhelmed all of these plans laid in the capital in Philadelphia that Knox had for treating the Indians in a humane uh, and, and civilized manner. Uh, there were just too much popular movement in every uh, uh, area. Uh, the, uh, and of course, the biggest illusion of all was slavery. All the founders, not a single one, defended the institution. It was so such a violation of the meaning of the revolution that nobody could defend it. But they all thought that slavery would die naturally, that with the ending of the slave trade in 1808, that slavery would simply disappear, overwhelmed by free labor. Uh, now they could not have been more wrong. Uh, despite the freeing of tens of thousands of slaves in the North, the North it was not inconsequential in the North. 14% of the population of New York was enslaved. Nonetheless, by 1804, all the Northern states had set slavery on its road to, uh, to elimination. But in the South, it remained and grew, despite the dreams, the illusions of the founders. Now, all of them who lived into the 19th century died disillusioned with what they had wrought. The society was much more democratic, much more popular than they ever expected. Now before we become arrogant and condescending towards this generation of founders for their illusions, we should realize that we live with illusions too, only we just don't know what they are. Uh, every society, every generation I think has its own illusions. In fact, I think history is a record of exploded illusions. But this leads, in my mind, to the lesson, the major lesson of history, which is humility. Humility is the consequence of realizing that you may not have all the answers to what is happening, and that future generations will look back at us and say, what were they doing? Thomas Jefferson, for example, thought that in as late as 1821, he said, there's not a young man now alive who won't die a Unitarian. I mean, how, how wrong could he be? And this is one of the smartest men of that whole generation. So we should not be cocky about what we know, uh, and uh, we should be much more humble in our approach to, the, to ourselves and, and to the past. I want to stop there because I want to have questions. Uh, we only have about 15 minutes to go. We've got a very tight a uh, tight uh, program here because Mrs. Bush is coming on board right away and then there's a whole succession of, 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 uh, of speakers. So if, if we could open it up to questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I guess there are microphones here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, after reading your book, I have a question about U.S. and British relations after the War of 1812. Even during the Civil War, U.S. relations with Britain were somewhat rocky because the British, at least some British, favored the South. But then by World War I, we were their ally. So right. could you comment on how the special relationship developed? Well, that's a big, I mean, <laughs> first of all, it's out of my period, as we, we say. But there's no doubt that uh, Britain was still a principal enemy through the 19th century. I mean, there were people in America who were Anglophiles, but by and large, we regarded Britain a as an enemy. It's not until the uh, 1890s, and you're quite right, the Civil War, we were quite worried about Britain recognizing the, the Confederacy. And Adams, uh, Charles Francis Adams, uh, as ambassador to, or minister, I should say, to Great Britain, uh, headed that off. But uh, the special relationship did not develop until the 1890s. John Hay, as Secretary of State, uh, and uh, it came out of a, a whole new sense of uh, Anglophilia that does prepare the way for the alliance in World War I. Uh, but it's a, uh, uh, it's a, there are books on this and it's a very interesting story. But it, the special relationship is really a late 19th century development. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I know the uh, French monarchy supported us in, in the war with Britain. Can you say something about the relationship between uh, the United States new government policy and France during the French Revolution? Well, the, that's a very interesting, very important question. Initially, of course, we welcomed, everybody welcomed the French Revolution because we saw it as a carbon copy of our own, which it was. 
Lafayette, who was involved in the early stages of the French Revolution, uh, he wanted simply to reform uh, the, the monarchy. He didn't want to eliminate the king, uh, and he later ended up as a victim fleeing uh, the, uh, the Jacobins in, in France. But at the initially, he was supportive, and he sent uh, to uh, Washington a, uh, uh, the key to the Bastille. The Bastille in the July uh, 14th uh, takeover, which is, initial, is the initial event in the French Revolution. He sends the key to Washington as a symbol of, of American um, co contribution to the French Revolution. It came, our revolution, our Republican Revolution came first and, and, and the French uh, liberals saw that. That key still stands or is hanging on the wall in Mount Vernon and many of you may have seen it there. Now, as soon as the French Revolution turned violent and especially after the Jacobins took over, uh, the uh, American society was deeply split along party lines. The Federalists supported England uh, and uh, Jefferson and his followers supported France and it contributed to the party split in the United States. Jefferson never really lost his feeling for France and he felt that the American Revolution's future as a Republican state in a, a monarchical world depended upon the success of the French Revolution. So he made extraordinary statements in support of the French Revolution. When his, uh, his, co his colleague and, and successor in Paris wrote back to him and said, Mr. Jefferson, some of your former friends is, are losing their heads in the guillotine, Jefferson's response is quite extraordinary. He says, well, uh, so be it. Uh, if only an Adam and Eve were left alive and left free, that would, be, uh, that would be okay. This led the Irish journalist Connor Cruz O'Brien to say that Thomas Jefferson was the pot Paul of the, uh, of the 18th century. Now Jefferson never uh, really uh, would have implemented that, but he, his support for the revolution was deep and it split the society and made the Federalists feel as if they had a fifth column in their midst and that France might invade the United States as it was invading every other state in Europe and creating a French puppet. That's what created the crisis of 1798. Yes, sir. Is there anything in the revolutionary and constitutional era that could illuminate such current uh, political phenomena as the birther movement, the Tea Party movement, the deep mistrust of government, good, and good the Good like? question. One thing you should realize is that the popular politics is not new. Let me give you one example from 1808. Simon Snyder ran for governor of Pennsylvania. Simon Snyder was a son of a poor mechanic. He was self-educated, had no formal education, but a very smart guy, but lacking all of the cultural attributes of a, of a Princeton graduate or a Harvard graduate. And his, it, it, there, there was no Federalist Party by 1808 in Pennsylvania. The established Republican Party, Jeffersonian Republican Party, was appalled at a Snyder's attempt at candidacy and it split the Republican Party. Uh, and uh, the Thomas McKean, who was the former Chief Justice and himself a, governor, a former governor of Pennsylvania, called, uh, he and his followers called Snyder a clodhopper, and he had a followers of clodhoppers. Snyder took that term and said, wow, what's better to be than being a clodhopper in a society of clodhoppers? And he rode to victory with that slogan. That was popular politics that appalled many people. Uh, Daniel Tompkins in New York, a Columbia graduate, a wealthy lawyer, he knew better if he's going to win the governorship of New York, he had to be what? A farmer's boy. And he used that as his campaign slogan. Not that he graduated from Columbia and was a wealthy New York attorney. No, that would be a kiss of death. So he, he's a farmer's boy. So you have popular politics of a sort that is being expressed today, I think in the Tea Party, Party movement, in Christine O'Donnell and Sarah Palin, there's a class dimension to this resentment, and it's very similar to what went on with, uh, with, what, with American politics in the North in, in the early decades of the 19th century. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, good morning, Professor. Uh, I was wondering uh, to what extent did religious aspects uh, have on driving the revolution, the idea of America as the city on the hill, the new Jerusalem, driving out European control and influence? Right. Well, I think there is a, a, certainly an evangelical Puritan emphasis during the revolution, but it, it's a secular as well. This notion that we were the last best hope, as Lincoln said, 
comes out of the revolution, that we were the, the forerunners of, of, uh, of, uh, of revolution and that it would spread. That's why they welcomed the French Revolution, that this democratic or revolutionary Republican revolution would spread throughout Europe. And so we supported all of the revolutionary efforts throughout the 19th century, with one exception, all the revolutions, starting with the Greek, the Latin American revolutions, the revolutions of 1848, 1870, the French Third French Republic, all of these, we were the first state in the world to recognize the new regimes, most of all of which failed except for the Third French Republic. Uh, there was one exception, of course, it's the Haitian Revolution. We didn't recognize that, uh, that new black state uh, until the Lincoln's administration. But otherwise, we supported all revolutions, much to the chagrin of conservatives. It's more than just a religious feeling. It's deeply embedded in our history. And when President uh, Bush uh, went into Iraq with some understanding that, uh, by some people at least, that we were bringing democracy to the Middle East, he was, uh, he was responding or echoing this kind of tradition, which is deeply rooted in our history. Now, we didn't invade other states, but we supported them diplomatically. And individuals actually went off and fought for example, in the Greek rebellion against the, uh, against the Ottomans in 1820. So that's been a deeply rooted part of our, our heritage. Yes, sir. Can you comment on the role of the Louisiana Purchase? Oh. Uh, did it add to the sense of people becoming Americans, or did it add to the turmoil that you mentioned the, the in that period? The question was on the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, it was, of course, Jefferson's wildest dream, uh, getting doubling the size of the United States and it was widely supported. A lot of Federalists, however, in New England were very upset because they realized that this would just create more Jeffersonian Republicans. All those states, Western states, were thoroughly Jeffersonian, Je uh, Republican. So uh, there were some mix mixed feelings. Hamilton supported it, however, although he gave no credit whatsoever to Jefferson. So I don't think it added to American identity. What, what was sad, I suppose, about it is that we didn't learn much uh, by absorbing this multicultural, multiracial uh, area. New Orleans was, uh, was a very different place from the rest of the United States with a Spanish, French, black, free blacks, mixed races, uh, and uh, an understanding of mixed racial mixture. And, and the, uh, the, the American people didn't learn much from that. It, it, we had to wait to an understanding of diversity to our own time. So the Louisiana Purchase uh, was not uh, something that brought, especially brought us together. Yes, sir. I'm fascinated by the thought that once upon a time we, we thought we could live without political parties. How is it that we came to become partisan and to think of ourselves as Federalists or Republicans? Right. Well, the dream, the parties by the term is partisan, partial. You're not thinking of the total good. And so parties for 18th century English speakers were always considered to be a sign of disease in the state. There's something wrong if you can't promote the consensus. And to some extent, we've always believed that. We've never really been very keen on political parties, despite the fact that we have them. We've had all, I mean, why would we have primaries? Why would we have open primaries? Uh, I mean, we've always had movements to, to somehow transcend parties, beginning with the liberal Republicans in the 1870s, uh, the Mugwump movement of the 1880s, and then the 1890s and 1900s progressive reforms were designed to bypass parties. When you, you know, there's no European party that would allow the nomination of its candidates to go out to the people in general, and especially allowing in open primaries opponents. So the parties have given up control of, their, of the most important function of a party, which is to nominate its candidates. No European party puts up with that. So parties have always been suspect. Now, nonetheless, they grew, and we finally, it wasn't until the 1830s and 40s, a new generation, that finally came to terms with, with party a, as, a, as a normal thing. The founders never did. They always felt that uh, parties should, be, uh, should go away. Jefferson assumed that uh, the, his Republican Party was a temporary party, and that as soon as the Federalists disappeared, he, they were monarchists, you see, in his mind, and, and as soon as they disappeared, party government would disappear. And that was the sense that people had in Monroe's administration, the era of good feelings. We've transcended parties. The Federalists have been wiped out, discredited, and, and we're entering a new era. But it was not, not to be. 
Yes, sir. Uh, my question is sort of along the same lines. I'm curious as to your feelings and what your thoughts are regarding uh, the Jackson uh, party machine and uh, as, as it relates to sort of undermining the John Quincy Adams administration and the right. Henry Clay deal. Well, I'm, although I'm not an expert on the Jackson era, um, I, think, I think it's open to a revision, revisionist interpretation. I think Jackson and his, uh, his administration are attempting to bring back some monarchical elements that the Federalists had attempted to build in the 1790s. As you know, Jefferson came into uh, power as president in 1800, and he uh, eliminated almost everything that the, uh, that the Federalists had built up, including the bank. He allows the bank charter, uh, or the Republicans allow the blank bank charter to, to lapse. So uh, all of the efforts to build a quasi, see Hamilton's program is quasi monarchical. He uses patronage within a Republican framework. He uses patronage, he wants to build a standing army, he's trying to build a bureaucracy, he's trying to create a, uh, a kind of surrogate monarchical substance within a Republican framework because he believes that that's the only thing that can hold this sprawling United States together. Now it turns out that, uh, that uh, Jefferson repudiates all of this. Jackson comes along and what does he do? He builds patronage all within a democratic framework but he s institutes patronage, the spoil system. He builds a huge bureaucracy relative to what Jefferson wanted and he uh, is not opposed to a strong army uh, and military force. So I think we could see J uh, uh, Jackson trying to, and of course he makes the presidency uh, a quasi monarchical as Washington had in, in the 1790s. So I think we can see that, and of course the president remains, a, uh, as many people thought he was at the beginning, an elected monarch. As our president, Article II is an extraordinarily strong, creates an extraordinarily strong uh, executive office. And, and so I think we are open to a revisionist of, 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 of the Jacksonian era. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.